video. Today we're going to meet David, who has lived a truly <laughs> varied and interesting life. Would that be a fair statement? Uh, and it's not over yet. <laughs> and it's not over yet. Lots more to go. <laughs> so, uh, David, tell us about yourself and your life and how you lived here, ended up here living in an Isuzu Trooper in uh, the Coconino National Forest. Yeah. Um, so I grew up traveling a lot, changing schools a lot, and became really accustomed to new environments, new scenery. And um, so I found I've always been comfortable with change and new environments. And um, probably about six years ago, I started making forays, uh, spending time living out of my vehicle, particularly in the summer. Um, I've always done a lot of backpacking. And um, I was a priest for 20 years. I left the priesthood. Um, and the wilderness, it always was, but it really became my source of connection with the sacred. And so I started, uh, it was five years as a wilderness guide for programs for youth at risk, uh, young adults with addictions. And there I got to live um, pretty much 18 days of the month out on wilderness land, backpacking, um, living in below zero temps in the winter and really hot in the summer. Um, and that was a lifestyle that I had for about five years. Um, oh, you did that for five years? Five years. Right. Yeah. Um, and you, you had retired from the priesthood and you actually had a, a mm -hmm. pension. Yep, and so I started a second career as a wilderness guide at like, in my 50s. Well, it goes uh, together logically. Yeah, and then I, <laughs> I went to uh, Naropa, which is a sort of an avant-garde school in Boulder, started by some Buddhist folks. And and, one and, of the, and you were, what kind of a priest were you? Episcopal. Episcopal priest. Yep. To and then Buddhist, also, uh... also, I was a Greek Orthodox priest. Oh, okay. So that's <laughs> even real with the icons and the incense. And, um, but even when I was a priest, I was taking people out into the wilderness for camping trips and having mass outside and, you know, exposing people to that, um, to God in nature, you know. And, and then for me, it, it, there was no distinction. It was not God in nature. It's, it's, it's the sacred, you know, is nature. So I didn't, it's just, it was just seamless in that sense. Um, so part of that time when I was a wilderness guide, um, there's only two programs in the country that I know of that offer masters in wilderness therapy. So I went to Naropa and did that as well during that time frame and, um, and yeah, but I didn't want to be a therapist. You know, I just wanted to be out, be out with the kids. And so that's what I did for five years. Um, did some hospital chaplaincy after that. Um, but finally, um, so everything you've done yeah. has been to help people. Yeah, it, it yeah. Um, a common thread there is yeah. you love nature and you love helping people. Yeah, there's an interesting, that brings up, uh, there's a quote from a, an old monk, and you know that word vocation, which we don't hear much about anymore, but I really like that word that we, we each have a vocation. And he defined vocation, he says, is where um, the world's greatest need meets our deepest desire. And so it's, it's seamless again, you know, it's, it's, um, it's all one in terms of my own desire that's fulfilled in helping people, particularly as they connect to their true selves in nature. And hopefully that's been of some value and service to them. I'm, yeah, I'm certain of it. <laughs> yeah. I'm certain of it. Yeah. So you've studied a lot of the science behind the impact of nature oh, on, yeah. on the human well, well-being. Yeah, there's, there's a field called eco-psychology, uh -huh. which is one of the emerging disciplines within the field of psychology now, which speaks very directly to our basic, deep psychological need to be connected to what many people call the more than human world. And without that, we suffer greatly. And so for from an eco-psychological eco point of view, um, our depressions, our addictions, um, our unhappiness with life is directly related to our loss of contact with being in nature, being with the rocks and the ground and the trees and the clouds. 
which we, from an evolutionary speaking, just simply from that point of view, it's embedded in our psyche. And, and our current contemporary culture um, does not recognize that, in fact, tries to keep us from any experience of nature, you know, in terms of keeping us addicted to technological things. Right. And it's not that technology is bad, because I use it all the time, but, but without some, some regular contact with the more than human world, we can't fully be human and happy, I think. It almost seems to me like our fears have, um, when we were just talking about this earlier, our fears have materialized in anything natural, and we avoid it like the plague. Exactly. We were talking about uh, our fear of discomfort. Yep. I mean, you must face some discomfort living in your Isuzu Trooper. Yeah, I mean, it It doesn't feel like discomfort, but it is. Right. You know, uh, Compared to living in a five-star hotel. Yeah. Uh, but that's not where the that's not where the juice is, you know. That's, that's not, not where <laughs> that's not where the aliveness yes. comes from. In fact, it's deadening to me. Not that I don't enjoy five star hotels if I get a chance, but I don't want to spend too much time there. And I'm always happier when I get back out to this. Right. You know. So yeah. So we're not looking for discomfort. No. But life has discomfort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's something um, something for me in. Uh, Knowing that I'm safe, so I have all the right gear, um, so I'm not in I'm not in physical danger. Um, and once that basic um, concern is taken care of, then it's like bring it on. You know, I I feel more alive with the the, the thunderstorms and the lightning crackling over there. And yes, I'm going to do a lightning you know prevention and do what I need to do to keep myself safe. But but there is such exhilaration in being in nature when um, when it's volatile and, and to be part of that and to feel that, to experience that. It makes me feel more alive. A saying I, uh, I've adopted is, only the dead never are uncomfortable. Yes. They're the only ones There's who are of, never uncomfortable. Plenty of time for that. And we're doing everything we can to emulate them. Yep. That's not good. So, uh, go on with your story. You yep. were uh, Episcopal priest. Yep. Uh, you started doing wilderness mm -hmm. guide. Yeah. Uh, you were a. Uh, you worked in Moab as a. Yeah, I've uh, I've done lots of outdoor. Even in my so I started this in my fifties. This sort of outdoor work, and so um, one of the things I was concerned about with the teenagers when I first started that work was, okay, they're going to make fun of me because I'm I'm the old man, mm -hmm. you know, because most of the guides are in their 20s, sometimes early 30s, and here I am in my 50s. And so I was, and you know how kids can sometimes be ruthless in terms of their, uh, yeah, their pointedness with uh, what they really believe. And it was exactly the opposite. I never had one experience of that. The kids were like in awe and so affirming and say, gosh, I wish my, wish my dad was like that, you know? And so that was such a confirmation of, me and that line of work that I did for so long and um, but I knew that at some point I wanted to live as close to nature full time all the time as I you know as I could and so finally circumstances came about I was able to get on social security and the pension and um, and now I've started you know some more work uh, as a vision quest guide and different programs to meet different groups of people but essentially um, to invite people to experience the wildness within and the wildness without, because it's, it's a mirror. And the more we get in touch with the wildness without, the more we can get in touch with our own wildness within, which I think is life-giving um, and, and healing. And so um, I have programs under Wild Spirit Passages that offer Vision Quest, shorter opportunities for people to experience nature in a, in a way that can be healing and transformative. Well, say that again, that was your website name? Mm -hmm. It's wildspiritpassages.org. Okay. Um, and uh, I encourage people to go there and see well, what's So there. just if anyone is interested, roughly what is it going to be involved? Do they need to bring their own gear? Do they go to a retreat house? Yeah, every program is different. For Except example, we're just a little bit yeah, walking away. Every program is different. Okay. Uh, there's one coming up in the Pecos Wilderness outside of Santa Fe. It's a camping, base camping weekend. 
with um, another guy that that I know from Santa Fe and we're going to be doing the medicine wheel and that's just looking at the four directions and each direction signifies uh, a stage in our life and just being out in nature and coming back and sitting down together and sharing what we experienced you know for two or three hours solo out in nature uh, we can see where we're out of balance and um, see where we want to go in the future up to like a 10-day vision quest where we really want to mark a rite of passage either from adolescence to adulthood but particularly in our culture now for elders uh, because our culture doesn't have a good uh, rite of passage or a good view of getting old in fact any word that's usually associated with that in our culture is negative and so it's hard for us as we enter into elderhood to get a sense that we are still of value, that we still have something to offer, that we're a benefit. So a vision quest where we intentionally claim elderhood can be life transforming. Um, so that involves a four day fasting, uh, solo in the yeah, wilderness. That leaves me yeah. Four days and four <laughs> nights. Yeah, well, no, I'm you, kidding. I'm yeah, kidding. I can do it. We I sort can... of find out what we need and what we don't, yeah. you know, but uh, so, you know, that's at one end, but then there's other, like I said, where it's just art. Uh, one day medicine walks where I can either individually or with others we go out in nature for a one day uh, walk out in nature and and again it's we sort of have to I encourage people to suspend their belief if they don't really believe they can have a conversation with a tree um, or that an animal can come as a messenger so I say well just pretend if, if that's really hard to believe of course for human beings throughout history up until recently they have, would have found it unthinkable that somebody would think that you can't have a conversation with the more than human world because they were doing it all the time and and that's how they learned laws to govern uh, what was healthy and beneficial was from observing and being in contact with nature mm -hmm. so everything from a one-day walkabout you know to a vision quest um, can you give us an idea of prices so people have an idea of what or is that still too new for you no it's uh, I think I'm rather unique in terms of these programs in that um, it's based on offerings so often if it's a vision quest though I, I need like a some monies to be able to get the permits and insurance and things like that but that's minimal so a few hundred mm. uh, most vision quests are fifteen hundred dollars to two thousand right. I think that's getting more than needs to be you know but everybody has to d decide who offers these you know what's what they need but for me uh, I prefer the more Buddhist way which is because uh, I there's something in me that resists charging for ceremonies or spiritual services and so, yeah, once the basic uh, cost, so they're not losing money, is met, then it's, it's by the nature of uh, offering. So. Mm -hmm. Good. Very, yeah. very good. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, I can almost count me in. I'd love to cool. do something with you. Yeah, yeah. great. Really, we'll, we'll plan something. We will. Yeah. yeah. Thank uh, you. Honestly. Uh, not, I'm not just saying that either. Good. Thank you, mm -hmm. Bob. Um, and so, uh, well, then that's where you're at now and kind yeah. of what you're at this, uh, mm -hmm. this stage of your life. Yep. Yeah. You've lived your whole life serving people, hmm. caring about people, and hmm. connecting them with nature as much as you could. Right. Um, and so that's just what you're doing. It's all coming together. Yeah, it's it, exactly. Uh, it's it's claiming that next stage. Right. And a full elderhood. A full elderhood. Exactly. Right. That's exactly. That's what when I went on my vision quest in Death Valley. Um, it's very important that you have an intention and a very clear intention when you do a vision quest and you're going to go out and fast by yourself for four days and four nights. And my intention was, strangely, well not strangely enough, I don't know what it means, but a priest of the wild, you know, a priest that's not conferred by an organization, but, but a priest is one who helps bridge the sacred um, with what has seemed to be the non-sacred, but to help you get in touch, you know, with the more than human world to bridge the human and the non-human and so um, and to claim elderhood so that was in Death Valley a couple of years ago and that's sometimes it takes a while for the vision quest intention you know to unfold and and so two years is not unnatural in terms of it's now coming to more clarity and uh, fulfillment so there's nothing else I'd rather be doing
than leading others into yeah. a full relationship with, yeah. with themselves and with nature. Right, and then living that myself. Right. Uh, and it's not that people can't do this, you know, based out of a home somewhere, but for me, um, I just want to be out all the time. And so if I go lead a vision quest, it's not any different in terms of my own uh, living, you know, right. <laughs> lifestyle. I just drive to where the Vision Quest place is and and do what I always do. Right. You know, so I think it makes it more authentic in some way um, because sure. because it's because this is my home, and wherever I'm out in nature, it's it's home. That whole I think about the whole idea about homelessness is really interesting, isn't it? How can we be homeless? You know, when we have nature and the earth. So, right. So right. I always feel at home. Right. You're always wherever you are. You're home. <laughs> yeah. Which is the way it should be. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, anything else? Uh, let's kind of wrap that up and then look at how you actually are physically. That's yeah. how you're actually living. But uh, are we missing anything? Something else you want to share with us? Uh. Yeah. I. <clears throat> just that, living as close to the earth uh, as I as I can and being experiencing. Um, the land every day in it, in its natural format is what is so healing and transformative for me. And uh, so that's, I feel such gratitude that I can do that. So, David, you live in an Isuzu Trooper? That's crazy. Only a crazy person or a nut would live in a Isuzu Trooper. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. I kind of take that as a compliment. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you really yeah. do live in an Isuzu Trooper. Yeah, it's what I travel around in. Yeah, and uh, uh, it's my uh, Hidalgo, you know, from that movie Hidalgo, uh -huh. the trusted Mustang that has a heart that can't be stopped. And uh, so, yeah, uh, Hidalgo and I are uh, partners in this venture of uh, getting us to beautiful, wild places. Okay, well, why don't you show us how you've accomplished this amazing feat of living in a uh, of an Isuzu troop? Okay, um, the first thing that I that I want to say about that is um, my style and approach to living uh, from, I might say from mm -hmm. the Isuzu Trooper, is <clears throat> more of a mountaineering, backpacking approach. Mm -hmm. um, so the gear that I use and my, my mindset tends to be a backpacking, mountaineering expedition uh, type mindset. So I cook outside as much as I can. I, I tend to use backpacking equipment. And so the Isuzu is what carries it from one place to another. Um, but I like being as close to nature as I can and having really good gear so that if it is blowing a blizzard, even if I'm in a tent, I'm, I'm warm, I'm safe, I can make hot coffee, I can cook. Um, so it is more of a mountaineering or backpacking lifestyle but living from the vehicle instead of having to fit it all in a backpack all you have to do is fit it all inside an Isuzu Trooper that's exactly seems it. seems a little easier yeah <laughs> and part of my lifestyle is to particularly uh, now that it's getting warmer and the snow in the high country in Colorado is lessening then I can spend a week or two weeks of every month on a backpacking trip um, and and not and not be limited to just where I'm parked so that's an important piece of my uh, lifestyle and the way that I view uh, traveling and living in nature. Right. Right. Okay. Well, so show us how you do it. Okay. Uh, I've had four of these uh, Isuzu Troopers. I forget what year they stopped importing them. They still make them uh, and import them to other countries. This is a 1991, which was the last year they made this body style, which was the classic uh, style with... Uh, uh, the box, the boxy room, which it's got the most headroom of almost any SUV that I've that I've come across. Which is really important. Very important. And uh, if we look inside, there's a big dog in there. And so he <laughs> has to have lots of headroom. So what I've done with each Isuzu is take the back seat out and then lay a platform across, which provides a lot of flat space. There's Trekker. Yeah. Hi, Trekker. Yep. So there's plenty of room traveling for him to have uh, his room. And then for the storage that I need for the equipment, you know, that I bring, 
an innovation that I only thought of on this go around of uh, traveling was to take the passenger seat out. Yeah. And again, lay a platform across so that it's it's even with the back platform. So there's one seamless platform going through all the vehicle except for the driver's seat. And so I refer to uh, to the bedroom where Trekker sleeps, and then I have the living room. And again, it's like being in a small tent. Um, I've often found that I actually prefer sleeping in here than in a tent right now. So for the past month, I haven't s set up my tent um, because I have a really nice headboard back here with the dash, and I can lean against. This is a clothing bag. Um, and then my sleeping bag runs this way. It gives Trekker lots of room for him to sleep. And I am so comfortable and cozy here. And one of my great joys of camping and backpacking, uh, which I picked up from my mountaineering days, is I have my backpacking stove here and my percolator and my heavy whipping cream that is already set up for the morning and so without even moving I just light the stove put the percolator on and I watch the sunrise as you can see there's lots of window space lots in here space. I can watch the sunrise uh, never having done nothing more than move my arm out of the sleeping mm -hmm. bag and enjoy that first cup of hot coffee in the morning right. so that's a that's a great you know one of the things too about living this lifestyle is that the simple things, the joys of, of a meal, of coffee, of cold water, uh, of being warm, um, they become uh, so excruciatingly beautiful uh -huh. and pleasurable uh, that it's, that, that's lost when you have all the conveniences, quote-unquote conveniences, when you're living you know, in a four-sided city dwelling. Right. Instead of waking up and thinking about your boss and the problems with your coworkers and your spouse and yep. on and on and on, the wor money and worries and fixing this leaky sink that day, and you wake up, you look out, and there's a beautiful nature everywhere around you. Yeah, and that's one of the things that a lot of backpackers uh, talk about is that when you're backpacking, it's all about, uh, you know, being being warm, being well fed, um, finding the right route. And so your mind is totally focused on things and those kind of things, and you don't have time to worry right. about things. And, and you find there's such a satisfaction in that, that the biggest problem in the day is to make sure that you have water by the end of the evening. Right. And it becomes such a different way of living and experiencing life. And then you find out, wow, this is really pleasurable. <laughs> and, and then going back to your discussion about echo psychology, yep. the stress falls off. Yeah, and the stress hormones calm down. The cortisol, yeah, yeah, is lessened, and yeah, you're you're healthier in body, mind, and spirit. Right, and yeah. you will live a longer, better life. Yep. So, I'm gonna yep. walk around back, and okay. would you mind uh, climbing in so we get a picture of the idea of your headroom? Yeah. So, oh, you mean from the back? Yeah. Well, yeah, just inside, so that we give an idea that you have an amazing amount of headroom in here. Oh yeah, I mean it's. It's, in, I mean, it's, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, I have, uh, in some of my former troopers, I did build a bed in the back, um, but I found that it was, um, it did take up too much. You know, I did not have, I don't like feeling like I'm, you know, if I, like I can't sit up in bed. Right. And, well, you've got a good foot over your head. Oh, now. yeah. You're not sitting yeah, straight I mean, I up. Can even, I can even sit up here. I mean, I could stretch out here. I've done cooking in here when the weather was so bad and I didn't want to set up my tent. Um, and it's You could build a platform the height of the wheel well and still, Yeah. I, I wouldn't. I think I'd go a little lower. Yeah. But that would really give you yeah. a lot more underground now, storage. There's, there's, um, if I were um, more handy with construction, I think there's a lot that I could do inside here that would still give Trekker, you know, all the room that he needs and um, but for right now, it's it's worked out. It's worked out great. I do plan to put a, a Yakima box on top, mm -hmm. and um, that just means that everything doesn't have to be um, taken out. You know, every time I pull into camp, perhaps it can be you know kept up top. So, but I find I like the ritual of uh, setting up camp. 
uh, taking things out, uh, and it's minimal. And that's the other thing, of course, is living in a, a space as small as this is uh, it encourages not a lot of accumulation of stuff. But I'm a gear addict, and so there's so many lightweight, um, lightweight pieces of gear for backpacking and expedition work that is so applicable to to camping that it takes up minimal space and uh, and there's just joy in using something you know that is really well made and 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 is dependable. This I can get back in the back country. Um, if I if I need to or go on a road that maybe some vans wouldn't want to go on if it rained they would be afraid of getting out perhaps so this is ideal um, and it's yeah it suits me great and uh, the divider is to keep trekker back here you know I don't think it would it it doesn't work as <laughs> like that like I thought it would um, but I originally got it to be able to hang like with uh, carabiners I could hang gear on sure. there. And then the other piece is it's just aesthetically pleasing to me. So a lot of what I surround myself with, um, uh, since it's my home, has to do with what's aesthetically pleasing, what what makes me feel good looking at it. Well, David, thank you so much for sharing your home with us. I mean, it's real simple, but yeah. it works. Yeah, it's great. It gets you out where you want to be, which is connected to nature. That's the number one reason why I'm here. Right, and uh, and that is where the magic happens. Yep. Connected to nature. Yep. So this is your little magic Isuzu Trooper. Little magic Hidalgo. Oh, yeah, Hidalgo. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, folks, there you have it. Uh, you know, this is not probably not the life for everyone, but maybe this is the life for more of you than you think. Maybe this is what you've been longing for all your life. At least open your heart to the possibility that less really could be more. Yeah. And that more nature could be the healing that your heart cries out for. So until our next video, we'll, uh, we'll sign off and I'll say uh, thanks for watching. Uh, like us on YouTube and subscribe to our channel. We'll talk to you later. Bye, David. Hi, thanks, Bob.